still wrong. We're here with Brian Taylor, Professor of Urban Planning in the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, Director of the Institute of Transportation Studies and of the Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies. Welcome to Uncut. Thanks for inviting me. A lot going on in the Los Angeles transportation scene. Is it a lot. Is it the beginning of a new era? Well, it certainly is in terms of investment. Uh, Los Angeles has probably put more money into public transit than any metropolitan area in the country over the last couple of decades. And a lot of that is a reflection of serious concerns about traffic congestion. Uh, LA is often thought of as the auto capital of the, of the country. It, it's not by many measures, but uh, its congestion is certainly the most severe. And because of that, public officials have been able to convince local voters in 1980 and 1990, and again uh, two years ago, to pay for sales tax increases. And we now have a one and a half cent sales tax that goes to pay for local transportation improvements. And those, uh, those revenues are matched with uh, state and federal money. And we've been able to invest significantly in some highway upgrades and a significant expansion of our rail transit program and upgrades and improvements to the bus rapid transit service. So a lot has gone on. Now, one thing that's happened during the uh, recession is that traffic congestion eases a bit as uh, employment drops. So. Um, most analysts consider that when, um, uh, when the economy does recover, that uh, traffic delays will come back with a vengeance and that, uh, that uh, concerns about this congestion will continue to grow in spite of these, these new projects. So now is the time to deal with some of these issues. In many ways. And it's also a, a good time to build because uh, construction costs tend to be lower. Well, let's go through some of these projects. The Expo Line has opened from downtown Los Angeles to Culver City. Uh, Not yet to Culver City. Well, to La Cienega Boulevard, which right. is almost Culver City. Right. Yeah, in the summer it'll reach Culver City. Okay, um, is that a is that a major step for Los Angeles? Well, it's a major project. One of the dilemmas that often happens, and I talk to uh, folks in the media about this generally, they say, "Well, what about this project? Is this one going to do it?" We're now talking about an area that has nearly uh, 17 million people, and it's uh, it's about 4,000 square miles. It's a huge metropolitan area, over 75 million person trips a day. So that any project, no matter how significant is likely to have a relatively small overall effect on regional travel and delays. And that's not because they aren't important projects. It's just because the nature of the area is so huge now that the, that the incremental addition is, is relatively minor. So in the case of the Expo Line, uh, it is going to increase the connections between Culver City and the southern parts of West Los Angeles, the USC area, and then up to downtown. Uh, right now, ridership is relatively low, but that's partly because it's only a partial system and we're anticipating more riders as it comes on board. Uh, so it is likely to provide yet another option for people to move between the, the, the west side, uh, the USC area, and downtown. Uh, and that will provide uh, a benefits for people. Is it likely to have a significant effect on traffic congestion? No. But what it is likely to do is provide people for an alternative to travel and congestion. So if we think about New York, we have the most extensive transit system in the country. We also have very congested streets, but people have many options for how to get around. They can walk to many destinations. They can take a cab. They can take the subway, they can take buses, or they can drive. Uh, in Los Angeles, we're creating more and more of those options. Those options are likely not to get rid of congestion, but to provide a lot of alternatives for how to navigate your way through congestion. Politically, do you think the Expo Line will be viewed by people in Los Angeles County as, as a success, as a good use of, of their money? Well, these projects have proven very popular, in part because they tend not to be as invasive as, say, a new freeway project, which displaces, uh, you know, it's a right-of-way of 160 to 300 feet. It has uh, sort of a huge uh, displacement effect. It's very uh, 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 big and noisy and crowded to put in. These lines tend to be able to be shoehorned into existing rights of way in ways that are less disruptive. Although you do get complaints from neighbors right alongside the lines, they tend to be more popular. Uh, the way I would put it is that right now, rail transit is the most politically acceptable way to expand transportation capacity. And it's one of the reasons why we're going after that pretty aggressively. There's also been some progress on another project, and that's the Purple Line subway extension into the west side. Yes. There's no construction going on yet, but they've made some, uh, uh, the, EI, the, uh, the EIR is out, and they made some decision on the locations of stations. Uh, is that a milestone that should be noted by people in the region? The, um, the Wilshire subway, or what, what's the, 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 the Purple Line, is, uh, is probably the most justifiable rail transit investment uh, in the well, certainly in Southern California and possibly in the Western U.S., just because of the nature of the environment through which it runs. But that creates a problem for itself. It's what I call the subway builder's dilemma, is that the places where rail transit works best is the places precisely where it's most expensive to build it. 
In other words, you, you, uh, you don't lay it out into green fields. You put it into already built up areas. And what subways are is they're, they, they have to be sunk down into already built up areas, which is very expensive to do. It's going to cost uh, between three and four hundred million dollars a mile to build this subway, which is enormously expensive. In general, when you lay something on the surface, then you put it in the air. It's about ten times more expensive to put it in the air than on the surface. And when you go underground, it's about ten times more than putting it in the air, or about a hundred times more than laying it on the surface. So one of the advantages is through that very congested Wilshire corridor, we're adding capacity underneath. But we're doing so at a very high price. And you, here you have a corridor that has uh, a history of oil drilling and, and gas. You have uh, buildings that ha have, uh, in many cases, very tall buildings along Wilshire Boulevard with very deep uh, uh, anchors. You have all of the utilities underneath. All of that has to be relocated. And it has to be constructed in a way that allows people to still move through the corridor for the years it takes to construct. So if we had known years ago that Wilshire Boulevard would be Wilshire Boulevard, or if we'd known that Market Street in San Francisco was going to be Market Street, we could have laid those underground lines very cheaply with, through a method called cut and cover. You just dig a trench and you cover it up. It's much cheaper than doing boring where you have to go in and drill and pull everything back out. You have, everything that comes in has to go back out. and It's a more complicated and expensive but less disruptive way of building the subway. And that's, that's how they would do it through that part of the corridor. Does the subway have political will behind it at this point? Uh, well, there's enormous political will. I think that, uh, like high-speed rail in California, when the price tag becomes uh, uh, more and more well-known, that, that'll be difficult to, to push forward because it'll be uh, seen as, gosh, we're putting so many resources into this one line. And one of the things that, uh, that is common to transportation projects is that we want to spread them around the region. We want to give everybody kind of a little flavor. We can often say, well, what is the South Bay getting? Are we giving the East Side a line? And, and if you look at many of, the, many of the rail projects, it's often about making sure that each of the parts of the region is sort of getting its project. Uh, the problem is, is if one of the projects is significantly more expensive than the others, it can suck up all the resources. Which one is in this? Right. So, so on the case of ridership and projections about sort of benefits of throughput, uh, Wilshire's the easy winner. There's nothing that's going to come close to that, in part because if you look at the bus traffic on Wilshire right now, uh, it carries an enormous number of, of riders on both the local buses and the bus rapid transit. So you already have a market that's guaranteed to carry a lot of riders because people can walk to many of the destinations along there. There's so many both residential and commercial high rises along the Wilshire corridor. It's been called a linear downtown. I've actually published some work on the sort of the history of the, the Wilshire subway and the many attempts to try and build the subway over the years uh, that I'd be happy to share with you if you're interested. I'd love to see it. Okay. Uh, so speaking of Wilshire and, and uh, you know, it being the most expensive place to do any kind of projects like this, the Interstate 405 freeway widening project is continuing. Yes. A multi-year project and the next phase is going to be to close the on and off ramps at Wilshire Boulevard for uh, a phased project that's going to last about a year and really have an impact on traffic in that part of Los Angeles. Is that just something that we have to, that we should all just kind of get used to? Well, there's, there's a couple of things going on with, it, with the, the highway system in general. The interstate system was built, be, well, it started in 1944. We got in gear in a big way in 1956. Most of the freeways were built between uh, the late 50s and the early 1970s. And these are reaching the end of their useful design lives. And many of these facilities need to be reconstructed. Many of the bridges need to be reconstructed around the entire country, Los Angeles included. So one of the issues is that we need to rebuild many of these things. Uh, we have congested highways, and there's a desire to try and squeeze a little more capacity out of there to try and reduce delays. Again, we have to do that in somewhat of a politically acceptable way. And so the most common way that we're adding capacity to freeways is to add HOV or HOT lanes, high occupancy vehicle or high occupancy vehicle toll lanes to the center and keep the same number of quote unquote free lanes to the, to the side. The other is that we make geometric improvements at the intersection. So we have less what's called weaving crossovers. So there are significant improvements at the interchange of the 405 and the 101 a few years ago where we removed some weaving sections and it reduces delays there. So part of the Wilshire project is to do some reconstruction of the, um, of the bridges there. It's also to widen to allow for an HOV lane. And a big part of it is the geometric improvements to allow people to move on and off of the freeway with less weaving on the freeway and less weaving on Wilshire Boulevard. The ultimate effect is to try and uh, reduce the bottleneck that is Sepulveda and Wilshire and the 405 so that uh, east-west traffic on the surface can get through better and north-south traffic on the freeway can get through uh, better. Um, the problem is, again, like I talked about with the, uh, with the, uh, the subway, 
is that we have to do this all while we're still moving 300,000 people a day, or 300,000 vehicles a day through on the freeways, and I'm not sure, but a lot through on Wilshire Boulevard. So it would be easy if we could just shut everything down, reconstruct it, and put it back up. It could likely be done in just a few months, uh, even, even a few weeks if we went to 24-7 construction. But we can't do that. What we have to do is try and move things over, do construction in, the, in a in sort of a shoehorned in. It takes a lot longer. You finish that, you move everyone over, you move back, and back and forth you go. And so it drives people crazy because it seems to take forever. One of the things we do is that we narrow the lanes a bit. So a typical interstate lane might be 12 or 12 and a half feet. We might narrow it down to 11 and a half or 11 feet. Uh, you may not notice that uh, visually, but you do when you're driving. It feels like the vehicles are a little tighter. It means that people slow down. They're a little more cautious when they move through. That slows traffic, too. So one of the dilemmas is, is how do we balance the years it takes to reconstruct some of these facilities with years of delays associated with that so that we get payoff down the road against uh, the possibility, and, and increasingly we're seeing in some places, and Carmageddon was an example of that, and they've done some examples on the freeways where you just shut everything down you try and do the project quickly and get it back up and running. What kind of impact can people expect over the next year in West Los Angeles, Westwood, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, the places that need the Wilshire Corridor to get to the freeway? There's going to be increased delays along that, 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 that corridor. They're going to try and minimize it. I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of travelers are going to try and uh, move down to Santa Monica or uh, access the freeway at other locations, which is likely to increase congestion at those other spots. Um, uh, Sunset has also been experiencing reconstruction problems as well, and so uh, uh, and and for traffic just east-west crossing, this has been going on for a few years. So we're entering a new phase of this project, uh, but uh, it's not so different than what took place a few years ago, just to the south, uh, essentially between the Marina Freeway and the and the four, uh, the, the Santa Monica Freeway, right, the four or five corridor south of yeah the that Santa that Monica major reconstruction freeway. project took several years. There was significant delays at the intersections. The difference here. Is that, is that Wilshire in particular, but also Santa Monica and Sunset, these are major interchanges. And so uh, part of the goal is to make things better in the long term, but it does mean that drivers are going to experience more delays and they're going to chafe at them and, and, and grind their teeth. Um, I think they're doing their best to try and, and part of what, the important thing to understand is part of the reason it takes so long is their effort to keep as much traffic moving through as possible. If they could just close that extra lane, and they could get a lot more done, but they don't do that to try and keep people moving through there. So it's, uh, it's really a bouncing game. And there's a lot of research right now going on trying to, trying to decide, is it better to just close for a few days and do a lot of construction and then open it back up? That causes short-term disruption, but is it better than, uh, than these longer term? And it's really similar to uh, whether you like to take a Band-Aid off quickly or slowly. And they both end up hurting, uh, and this is likely to hurt a little bit. Do you have a preference better. on Band-Aids? Uh, I think that uh, I, I had been inclined to think that this approach, this longer-term approach, was better. But um, as, um, as I understand from uh, some of my engineering and construction colleagues, that they're getting better and better at extremely fast 24-7 uh, projects where they actually use incentives so that the, con the, the, the contractors have huge incentives to finish early, that people can make short-term adjustments for maybe a week or two, and if that could happen, you know, if you're able to get through that more quickly. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of work that has to go on to understand that is that we're used to stretching things out, and they, they're trying to learn about, well, could we pour all this concrete at once? Could we have fast drying that's going to be long, uh, long term? Are there, uh, how do we get the structure built? How could we get it down so quickly? And uh, I think that there's a lot of work going on on that. So we may see these projects be some of these more short term, significant disruptions in the, in the next few years. But we have to work everything out because you can't have a glitch. Everything has to come off smoothly because you're really, you know, it's sort of like holding your breath, waiting for that to get back online. Well, Los Angeles did that last year with when it closed down the 405 freeway for a weekend in Sepulveda Pass, it was right. known as Carmageddon, and it did go off pretty much without a hitch. And it's going to happen again this coming summer, and I understand you've studied what happened last summer. Uh, what have you learned? Well, w what we learned is that, is that um, uh, and, and this is, the, the lessons from Carmageddon were not so different than what we saw from the 1984 Olympics and others, is that uh, it is possible to affect very significant short-term behavioral changes. Uh, one of the things that we, we looked, we looked at a lot of the messaging, and they really sent out messages of both hope and fear. Uh, the, the hope was, uh, this can be, uh, this can, we can do this, we can change behavior, you know, change what you're doing, stay in your neighborhood, 
make adjustments, it's going to be fine and everything will go off smoothly. Another one was fear, it's going to be a disaster. Um, you know, it, it's going to be a nightmare. Stay off the streets. And uh, what happened... Is that happened, the right mix of communication? Well, uh, we argue ultimately no. And uh, the, reason, the reason is is that um, if, you, if you send a message that says, if you change your behavior, everything is going to be fine. If you don't, it could be disaster, would be the accurate way of putting it. And what happened was, the message was, it's going to be a disaster, stay off. Well, people stayed off the roadways, and they did to an enormous degree, and things went off without a hitch. In fact, it was smoother than we would have expected. We had statistically significant declines in freeway traffic in the city of Irvine, 50 miles from the facility. There was an overreaction to the, you know, the, the, the uh, ABC News said that there could be backups to the Mexican border, that things had gotten a little uh, too histrionic, and uh, it caused a dramatic behavioral change, which was really more than was needed. And if we had, I, and what we argued, if we'd messaged, uh, and we're, we're suggesting that this time they say, you guys did a beautiful job last time. You made these adjustments, and everything went smoothly. What is true is if they had just closed the freeway and those 300,000 vehicles tried to get through, it would have been chaos. But people made the adjustments, everything went smoothly. The problem is, is that some people said, hey, they told us it was going to be a disaster, and it wasn't. So what we're anticipating is that there will be some more delays this time. That people, we, you know, it's sort of a boy who cried wolf phenomenon is that, you know, you said it was going to be a disaster, it wasn't a disaster, I changed my behavior, this time I won't. And if too many people do that, then you could be actually back to that situation. So it's, a, it's an interesting um, uh, process of group psychology. And so in our study, we've looked a lot at how it was messaged, how people responded. What we found is that they made a lot of transit improvements, and actually transit ridership was down. Uh, we looked at, uh, did people make trips before or after the event? Did they go shopping the weekend before? Did they do their, their things the weekend after? Did they do things the day before, the day after? No. What they did is they just fundamentally changed their behavior for uh, essentially a day. And it opened uh, midday on Sunday. And we were, uh, we, when we look at the, the traffic levels around the area, we found that they started creeping up the whole time as people learned, hey, did you go out? The freeways are empty. And people started returning to their behavior. So pretty quickly they did that. And in the case of the 1984 Olympics, we found that. We said, we don't want to embarrass Los Angeles. We can pull together and, and, and put on a great Olympics. And we did. Uh, and what happened is, is the traffic was vanished for the first few days of the Olympics. And then over time, people started saying, have you been out there? It's amazing. You know, and they started. So by the t end of the Olympics, we were returning to normal traffic levels. So it's a familiar pattern. Yes. Yeah, so, so what you can say is that uh, are people likely to completely change their lives based on warnings from public officials? No. But they are willing to make changes in the short term. And those changes can be pretty significant. But we suggest as well is it's, a, it's sort of a valuable tool that you don't want to overuse. So one of the questions was, could we do this for every Dodger or Laker game? Probably not. Uh, but if we have uh, a president coming to town, if we have a major closure, if we have something we can anticipate, we can likely do messaging uh, that can lead to short-term changes in behavior. Speaking of the president coming to town, that does seem to be an issue in Los Angeles. Uh, the, the, the media coverage highlights the traffic congestion that's caused by the presidential motorcades. Is that unusual to Los Angeles? And is it something that, uh, that is a real concern? Uh, it's a significant disruption in places like Los Angeles and New York, where presidents fit, uh, visit a lot, and you have transportation systems that are already operating near capacity. Uh, That's one, key. one Yes. One of the, so if, if the president goes to vis visit Tulsa, you have a lot of slack in the transportation system and that disruptions of certain uh, networks are not a problem. Presidents also tend to go to midtown Manhattan, Century City, places that are already very built up and, and, and very congested. And there's another problem with presidential visits is that uh, if we could know in advance and we could say, ah, here's where the presidential motorcade will be, stay away from that. Can't but tell. for understandable reasons, the Secret Service doesn't want to do that. And in fact, what they do is that they block off, as I understand it, we're not given a lot of information about this, is they block off actually multiple routes and then they pick one at the, at the last second so that someone couldn't anticipate some, some major event. Um, I think that there could be some benefit of thinking about what is the most uh, uh, effective way to move a public official in and out uh, that uh, both protects his or her safety and minimizes disruption. Um, so uh, the, these disruptions are, are severe. And what we find, and, and this goes back to the research we're doing on Carmageddon, is that um, that unanticipated events can be enormously disruptive because uh, we knew 
I mean, it would be virtually impossible for anyone to, to drive up to the Sepulveda Pass and say, what the heck's going on last summer? There had been so much messaging. But a, a truck jackknife's on that same roadway. Um, uh, the president comes to town unannounced, things like that. Those things, people don't have a chance to adjust their behavior. And the disruptions, as you can see, can, can ripple through a system. If the system is not near capacity, the ripples go very, you know, they dissipate very quickly. But if you're near capacity, you can cause a cascading effect that spreads through, propagates through a large part of the system. And that's why those visits to Manhattan and West LA are so disruptive. Interesting. You have done some interesting research recently on the, the dropping rates of driving by teenagers in the United States. What's going on there? Yeah, the Federal Highway Administration is very interested in what's going on with the future of travel behavior. And, um, I, uh, we've done a little bit of work related to this for the Southern California Association of Governments as well. And they, uh, the question here is, um, is new information technology uh, having effect on the future travel behavior of, of young adults and teens? And uh, we know that we have much better communication technologies than we did in the past. Uh, people our age have learned to adapt what we've always done with these new technologies. But we have generations of, of kids now who have never not known uh, instantaneous cell phone access, and that they've started to structure the way they, um, they manage their movement through time and space differently. It's less important to say every Wednesday at 10 a.m. we meet here. Uh, so you look at firms that have a lot of young people, they tend to make meetings like on the fly that, uh, that, that it's a you're able to sort of manage your movement through space and time differently. So there's been some research looking at that. And there's been some empirical observations that teen driving or teen licensing rates are plummeting, and in fact they are. Uh, I understand now, as of the latest data, only about 60% of all 16-year-olds are getting driver's licenses. What did it used to be? Uh, it was about 88%, something like that. And this is uh, in the 80s. So and this is a big drop. My daughter is 18. She doesn't have her license yet. And does this signal a lifelong change for, for these Well, people? that's what we're trying, to, we're trying to understand. And we're looking at how access to communication technologies, uh, how more stringent licensing regulations. Uh, licensing has changed a lot. Uh, it's much harder to get a license now. And there are more restrictions on your license when you do. Uh, so that uh, it used to be you went through a short training course. And when you got your license at 16, you had unlimited driving privileges. Now. Most states limit whether the teen can drive with other teens, whether they can drive at night, uh, all sorts of things about their behavior. And so what we've done is tried to understand that as well as there is evidence of um, more parental chauffeuring than there's been in the past. So that kids used to just walk to their local school or ride their bike to their local school and all their activities were at their local school. So now many schools have ended all of the, the extracurricular programs so people may go elsewhere for their soccer practice or their violin lessons. And uh, there's many more magnet schools. There's a larger utilization of private schools. So what you find is that not everybody is doing all the activities in their neighborhood. And that kids are uh, being chauffeured to schools and to these other things by parents mostly. But then there's another phenomenon is if you have magnet schools that are drawing from a much wider area, it means that your friend as an eight-year-old might not be two blocks away, but 12 miles away. And for you to get together, you may need to get chauffeured to there. So in my generation, if I had told my parents, give me a ride over to my friend's house, they would, oh, you know, you're on your own. Figure out how you're going to get there. Well, you don't want an eight or nine-year-old trying to negotiate a 10-mile trip. So you get used to this pattern of parental chauffeuring. So you have the greater IT access, tougher licensing, and greater chauffeuring. And what we find is that actual driving by teens is way down. Uh, however, and this is research we're just finishing up now, actual miles of travel by teens is not down. And in fact, uh, I think that in many ways our sponsors at the Federal Highway Administration were hopeful that there would be a trade-off, that the more you communicated with your, your peeps, uh, with your cell phone, and you were able to get information over your, uh, your increasing numbers of smartphones, that you would trade that off or substitute it for travel. Right? If I can communicate with my friend, I can do I can actually see them on the phone. Do I need to go physically see them? We find that there's a positive relationship. The more cell phone access you have, the more internet web access you have, actually the more travel you engage in. We also have looked at cohort effects. And what we find is, is that, well, people are much less li likely to license when they're 16. Uh, they're just as likely to license when they're 21. So we're seeing a more graduated movement into driving. And that may be better for safety. Uh, because you have more mature drivers and you have people sort of phasing into it. 
one of the downsides is, and some recent research has found this, is that um, you have more people who are just waiting until they're 18 and licensing, and then they can do so with, without restrictions. And there's actually a big bump up in crashes among 18-year-old drivers. Mm -hmm. So one of the big parts of avoiding accidents is practice, experience. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours is that you just need time behind the wheel. And even if you start driving at 25, you're just not such a good driver when you first start driving. And so uh, we may have just pushed the problem forward uh, a bit. Professor Brian Taylor, we look forward to more of your research. This has been Uncut. Thank you. Okay, thank you.